Good morning, this is Tyler Dawn Rosenquist of The Ancient Bridge, and I'm late with the newest installment on Small Bites of Fruit. Faithfulness, I've been being really trained on this one this week. As, as usual, it's not like I can sit here and teach you about things that I'm not being refined in myself. So this week we got faithfulness. We've done love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, now faithfulness. Now, when I went into Logos that some wonderful supporters just bought for me, I, I was very, very blessed that they that they did that to, to support, you know, my ministry work. I'm very honored that they would put such faith in me. Anyway, so I went into Logos. <clears throat> And um, what's faithfulness? Well, you know, you go into this, this, the Strong's, and it says, well, faithfulness is faithfulness. Okay. <laughs> but then when you go into the reverse interlinear and, and look at the words from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, that, that use the same word, that was used in the Greek for faithfulness, you find that it was most often translated as trustworthiness. Faithfulness was trustworthiness. Trustworthiness, especially in doing the jobs that you were called to do. So, you know, when you hear about somebody being faithful in scripture, it means that they were trustworthy to do what they were supposed to do. And that is huge. You know, obviously, we're living in a day and age where people are not trustworthy. Of course, that's never been any different. Don't think that... Well, yes and no. I mean, you've always had treacherous people, but it used to be more honor shame, certainly, than it is now. And now people say they'll do something, just they don't, and they don't feel bad about it. And you know, and I've done that. Goodness sakes. So... But what does it look like in the ministry? And yesterday I, I put out a blog post about it. But, you know, since I put out that blog post, I thought about other things. You know, as I said in the blog, to be faithful to the job we're given, we need to do that job and not try to be doing everybody else's job. I'm a teacher. That's all I can do. <laughs> I'm not... I'm not like Bezalel in Exodus, who God gave the spirit of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge for making all the things of the temple. I mean, the tabernacle, sorry, and the wilderness. I mean, that's huge. That's like, he was given, like, in all the arts, he was given the knowledge to do that. And, uh... In our lives, we're, we're not so blessed that somebody gives us, you know, a gift where we can do all the ministry work. You know, nobody can. We have the areas that we're gifted in, and then if we go into others, we're largely operating in the flesh. Now, if we're operating in the flesh while sending money to widows and orphans, you know, and... And that sort of stuff, that's a fine flesh to be in. Don't get me wrong. Everyone should be doing those things if they can. Unless, of course, they're the people in need and then we should be helping them. But what I found is that when I go outside teaching, okay, when people come to me wanting counseling or wanting me to act like an elder or wanting me to... Um, just any number of things, wanting me to, to host discussions, I get in trouble very quickly. I'm not gifted in those areas. But you know what other people are? They should be doing those jobs. But what we come across is a lot of times they, the people who are supposed to be doing those jobs, you know, the counseling and the and the the administration work, and all that kind of stuff, the other legitimate and important vital giftings of the Spirit are being neglected. I mean, we, we look out there on Facebook, and everyone's a preacher. 
everyone's a teacher. Not really everyone. A lot of people are posting cute pictures of kittens, which I enjoy. Um, and posting pictures of the family and, and, and that kind of stuff, you know, that's one thing I miss. I've stopped going on my Facebook wall because it is filled with statuses of people preaching who have not been doing this long enough and who are not anointed for it. And you can read and you can tell. And it's not because I disagree with them. Sometimes I agree with them, but it's just obvious that it's not their gift. But that's what they want to be out there doing because we have wrongly said that if you're doing that, you're a better believer than anyone else. I am not a better believer than anyone else just because I'm a teacher. Just means I get more flack than other people and probably more praise too. Yeah, definitely more praise, definitely more flack. But not everyone needs to be doing what I'm doing and not everyone should do what I'm doing. You know, that's my job. What if you're supposed to be doing something else entirely and because everyone who's assigned that task in the body thinks it's worthless and so guess what we've got a gaping hole because people aren't being faithful and then because people aren't being faithful other people just go to somebody who they admire for operating in one gift and then it's like the church system you know trained us to do you know they expect us to do everything okay sunshine no my husband's cat She's used to riding on shoulders, but mine are too small. <laughs> now she's angry. Okay, so where was I? Yeah, where jobs in the kingdom are not getting done. People aren't being faithful because they don't think they're good enough. But I'll tell you something, a job in the kingdom that isn't getting done, if that's the only job that isn't getting done, that's the most important job in the kingdom because we're all going to feel the lack of it. So we all need to get repentant really really repentant and think about the fact that what am i here for what god do you want me to be for and part of the problem is you know what we really don't have in the 21st century a concept of what it is to have a god when i wrote the bridge i didn't really understand before writing it what it was to have a father and to relate to a father and, and that sort of thing and, and, and God made that very clear to me. And he said, well, you know, we've got to deal with this lacking in you or you're not going to be able to sell this. And by sell, I don't mean profit. I mean, if I don't believe it, I can't make you believe it. And then when I wrote King Kingdom Citizen, I got to the point in the writing process where I just had to stop and realize, I don't know what it is. I, I don't, I, I give intellectual asset to god being my king but it's not really real for me well he had to make it real for me now i'm writing my new book eternal our god uh his temple and the priesthood working title and he's he's showing me he says culturally you guys don't know including me what it is to have a god they used to know you guys have lost it it's not your fault you just weren't raised that way and so because we've lost this cultural this cultural awareness of what a god is what the god is and how you react to a god and what you owe a god and the awe and the reverence and the majesty we're not going to be faithful because we're going to think it's okay to be something other than we were created and imbued with power from the Holy Spirit to be. I've been imbued with the authority and the ability to teach. Not with anything else. Can't do anything else. And as much as I, you might want to be a prophet. I'm not a prophet. I don't want to be a prophet. Who would want to be a prophet? I was told in the Pentecostal movement that I was a prophet. We were all told we were prophets. You know, but I've never met one. I've met people who can prophesy. But I've never met somebody who has that sort of communication going with God and is accurate. Just haven't. 
So faithfulness means that we find out what our job is and do only that job. And we do it with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength because it is loving God to do the job faithfully that he put us here to do in the midst of his children. And I'm going to go beyond that. And I'm going to say that if we are not where we are supposed to be, doing that job, that there are also problems. You know, people want to head for the hills and people are being told, leave the cities. I'm sorry. When did God stop loving the people in the cities? Yeah, I, I had a friend contact me a couple months ago after seeing someone speak. And he was going to leave Hollywood. And he was going to, he, he's not a movie star, okay? Don't, you know, most people who live in Hollywood are not movie stars. So he was going to leave Hollywood, okay? And he was going to buy a ranch, you know, land out in the middle of nowhere and just start raising cattle or, or whatever. I, I actually don't know. Different kind of goats and sheep, I think is what he said. Chickens. And with absolutely no experience whatsoever because he was all of a sudden terrified to be in the city. But are we supposed to be terrified of dying? Are we? Are we training people to be afraid of death? Are we training our children to be afraid of death and to... to have no expectation of growing up and starting families. Don't we realize that all of this fear talk and all of this preeminent tribulation talk has been going on for centuries? And what if every generation just said, you know what, I'm never going to be an adult, so I don't need to grow up. I did that with my kids. I didn't realize I was doing that with my kids. It took me a while to undo the damage. You know, they didn't want to work hard in school, which... Sadly, hasn't changed. It probably has nothing to do with that, but they had no expectation of getting married and being husbands or having to develop the character and fruit required for that important work because they were scared of never growing up, of being in the tribulation, not having to get a job, not having to train and become responsible. They didn't think they were going to be around. Okay, and that's what I see with a lot of people. But we have got to be in this for the long run in order to be faithful. And we have got to be where we've got to be, and it is better to die. I'll tell you, the Christians over in the Middle East, they know this. They don't want to die, but they're willing to die. I see a whole bunch of people who aren't willing to die. I was... You know, I was willing to stay in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, surrounded by, um, oh, I can't remember, I, Somali Muslims. Yeah, Minneapolis-St. Paul, huge area for Islam, okay? I was prepared to stay there. Through the end, if that's where God wanted me and that's where God called me to minister, because I have set, I've just decided that I'm probably not going to survive the tribulation and I've decided that it doesn't matter. I don't need to survive. That's not my goal. Nowhere in the word does it say survive until I come. It says occupy. Okay. We are supposed to occupy. And they were told in Babylon, you're not going back to the land anytime soon. You know, 70 years has been declared. You make yourself at home at Babylon. Okay? Don't think you can be faithful. Don't think that you can be faithful by leaving where the people are who need to be ministered to. Don't think it. Don't think it for a moment. It's a pipe dream. Yeah, we'd like to just, you know, sit it all out. But we were never called to sit it, all, to sit it out. You know, right now, um, 
Daniel McGurr, who's one of my co-teachers with Wisdom and Torah Talmudim, he's going to be doing a very, very important series on benefaction in the first century. And he's going to go into the mindset of the first century believers. And he's going to do different than what I've done. But he's going to cover the same thing. How they were faithful where they were. You know, even though some of the churches, you know, they, they thought, you know, why even do anything? Because everything's about to blow up in our faces. But we can't take that attitude, not if we're faithful. So I really highly encourage you to keep an eye on Daniel McGurr and this teaching that he's going to come out with because he's going to go in a different direction. And it's the same, same general thing. Faithfulness requires that we are doing what God has trained us to, that we're not doing anyone else's job. And that we're where we're supposed to be doing that job. And I'm going to go beyond it just real quick. Faithfulness requires that we aren't undermining other people, that we aren't exalting our ministries over everyone else. That we aren't mocking or making fun of other people or trying to steal their audience or promoting ourselves at the expense of everyone else. Faithfulness means I do my job and I trust God to be God, to be sovereign. And if he wants someone to listen to me, he can send them over, okay? I don't need to hurt anyone else's ministry, okay? I don't need to rub anyone else, any other author's face in my book sales, which really I have no reason to do because they aren't that great, right? um, which is fine. God wants me to sell more books. I'll sell more books. Rabbit trail, okay. If we're exalting ourselves, then we're not exalting God. We need to be faithful. We need to be trustworthy. Do the job he's called you to do. Don't worry about everyone else's job. It's not your responsibility. Maybe, maybe if the people who are out there trying to do everyone else's jobs stopped, the people who are supposed to do those jobs would see the need, see the importance of their jobs, and maybe they would finally step up and try, stop trying to do somebody else's jobs. It's something to think about. Anyway, have a very, very wonderful day and uh, be faithful.